It was during the Old Kingdom that most of the famous uh, and most impressive of the pyramids were built. Uh, so that uh, again shows you something about the power and presence uh, of the pharaohs in the Old Kingdom uh, that wasn't quite uh, as much uh, as you know afterwards in the Middle and New Kingdoms. Uh, in the Third uh, Dynasty, Dozier, uh, famous pharaoh, uh, built the largest tomb in the world, uh, the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara, which you see in the center there. Uh, it's hard to put that into perspective. Uh, uh, fortunately uh, for us, uh, if you look in the kind of lower right of the picture, uh, you can see three people, three or four people there. Uh, so that gives you a better sense of the size uh, of this. These, uh, uh, you know, the biggest of the pyramids uh, are astonishing uh, in their size and, and the engineering capability and, and amount of work that had and resources that had to go into them. In the first intermediate period, uh, between the dates you see there, uh, this is one of those uh, eras uh, when the power of the pharaoh temporarily, they didn't know that at the time, broke down. Although, uh, in the first intermediate period here, we'll see uh, that it, it wasn't sort of seen as that big of a break overall. Uh, quoting uh, a book that I started with earlier in the lecture, it is clear that the Egyptians did not consider the first intermediate period a major disruption in the flow of their history. Not only was there no apparent break in the continuity of of pharaonic rule, rule of the pharaoh, but the archetypal institutional form of government was still claimed by the local dynasties, meaning like the local no, uh, uh, nobles, lords, etc., each desiring to establish its own grip on the reins of power that had slipped from the hands uh, of the Memphite rulers or pharaohs. So that is to say that even uh, during this period when centralized power uh, coming from the pharaoh, the capital city broke down, the lords are now ruling kind of smaller kingdoms as chunks of Egypt are still trying to impose the same type of system uh, politically because it's what they knew. Uh, they're just now the, the, the leader, uh, kind of a, a big fish in a now a smaller pond. Then comes the middle kingdom uh, in the middle. Uh, so it's uh, appropriately titled uh, in the dates you see there. Uh, uh, Mentotep uh, was one of the great... Uh, pharaohs uh, of this uh, period, uh, and he uh, is the one who kind of reunited the kingdom uh, as sort of a unified whole under his power after the first intermediate period. So from centralized to decentralized, now we're back to centralized in the Middle Kingdom. Uh, in the 11th dynasty, uh, uh, he not only reunified uh, uh, right uh, Egypt, but uh, more effectively centralized uh, the kingdom uh, sent out governors for both Upper and Lower Egypt, of course reported back to him, uh, had mobile royal officials checking the power of nobles, which makes perfect sense after an intermediate period where the nobles had wrested power uh, from the pharaoh. Now this pharaoh who's sort of you know, taken power back unto himself, wrestled it away from nobles and, and, and centralized it again, wants to try to make sure that decentralization doesn't happen again, so he sends he got these officials around, appointed by him, powerful officials uh, that are kind of spying on, checking up on uh, these nobles in sort of one uh, in a place after another. So they're roving uh, uh, royal officials of great power, uh, trying to keep the nobles in check and under the watchful eye of the uh, pharaoh. Self deification, uh, sort of the further one of the further cements of centralization. So uh, uh, Mentotep made sure uh, that he, uh, you know, let everybody know, uh, if, as if they didn't need, you know, if they didn't remember already, uh, to uh, that he was a, a god and had to be worshipped as such. That's another way, I think, to you know, try to re-cement power after it had been uh, decentralized. Uh, so uh, uh, he also successfully invaded Nubia, uh, a smaller kingdom uh, to the south, that our textbook talks about more than we're going to have time to hear. Uh, an interesting kingdom in its own right. Later on, went on to defeat uh, the Egyptians uh, at, at sort of the end of the Egyptian empire. The second intermediate came, period came about uh, because of uh, the invasion of an outside force, the Hyksos, who came from Western Asia and through 
uh, of the Middle East uh, into Egypt. Uh, so a diverse group uh, uh, got to the Nile Delta around 1650 BC, uh, and uh, they brought about the uh, 13th dynasty uh, and the second intermediate period. Uh, a dynasty it was still, because uh, though the Hyksos had the ultimate say uh, during this period, fairly short in Egyptian history, they didn't conquer uh, all of Egypt. They controlled the Nile Delta, which we know is a big chunk of it, since uh, it's the, by far the widest and broadest uh, you know, chunk of real estate in the kingdom. The rest of it is along the Nile and along the Nile only. Uh, but they didn't conquer further south of that uh, because they didn't really need to. Uh, they, got, they basically made a deal. Uh, and so the Egyptian uh, leaders, uh, government said, okay, well, you can call the shots, just don't invade the rest of the way and let us sort of live our lives you know, pretty much how we did before. So there actually was a, a pharaoh uh, that still had some power, uh, but uh, he had to take ultimate marching orders from the Hyksos uh, in, the, in the north and uh, the Nile Delta. So they fought their way in in the first place, uh, partially successfully. I mean, they were successful partially because of the advantage of horses, chariots, and bronze weapons, uh, which eventually the Egyptians acquired themselves through diffusion, meaning uh, inventions and ideas spread, sometimes deliberately, sometimes they leak out or are stolen, uh, and the Egyptians eventually get these military technologies for themselves, and it helped them to kind of even things out uh, and eventually drive the uh, Hyksos out. Uh, but uh, they did uh, uh, capture uh, Memphis uh, and uh, forced uh, the rest of Egypt to pay tribute. That's part of the deal. We won't invade the rest of your lands. We'll just, you know, uh, stay here in the north, in the Nile Delta, uh, but you'll pay taxes. Uh, and they struck up this deal until uh, uh, this uh, uh, went bye-bye uh, uh, with an aggressive pharaoh again. Uh, later, uh, around 1550, who drove the Hyksos out. Uh, so uh, Amos, uh, the pharaoh in question, uh, began the New Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, by the way, we call this the, the New Kingdom, uh, and we divide between Old, Middle, uh, and New, and the, the various intermediate periods, uh, with some element of simplification. These kind of labels in history are in any subject. We put things in a neat little label boxes uh, are required uh, for human beings to think effectively about anything at all. Our brains are kind of like neat freaks. Everything has to be kind of ordered and organized and put in its proper uh, uh, spot. So uh, these labels are really useful uh, artifices for uh, humans who study this stuff so they can kind of keep it all straight in order. So Old Kingdom, New Kingdom... Uh, old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, intermediate periods uh, in between. Uh, Hatshepsut uh, and the 18th Dynasty and Tutmosis III, uh, uh, man and woman, uh, woman and man, uh, appear to have ruled as uh, together as equals. Uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, noteworthy. Since it didn't happen all that often in the ancient period. Uh, Hatshepsut was the foremost of noble ladies. So she came from a rich, powerful family. Uh, the, actually, the second woman to rule uh, as pharaoh, but uh, she made more of an impact here uh, later on. Uh, she reigned for about 20 years as a, a co-ruler, uh, uh, established many lost trade routes, so it was instrumental in uh, reviving trade after uh, sort of the previous uh, intermediate period with the Hyksos in the way. Had many monuments and statues built. Uh, most uh, me, uh, museums today that have Egyptian uh, uh, stuff stolen from uh, ancient Egypt, uh, or you know, later on, but still remaining in Egypt. Uh, a lot of it comes from uh, sort of what she had uh, built. Uh, Tuthmosis uh, reigned about 50 years, 20, with Hatshepsut as uh, a co-ruler. Uh, he was known for successful military campaigns uh, in Nubia to the south, Syria and Palestine uh, to the east, in what's today the Middle East. So by the New Kingdom, the... Uh, Egyptians were becoming an empire uh, in the sense of, you know, conquering an empire. Amenhotep IV in the 18th dynasty uh, is famous for uh, supposedly uh, leading Egypt in the direction of monotheistic religion, one god instead of multiple gods, although it's debated 
Uh, some scholars don't think it was true monotheism. Some think it was only partial because other gods were still worshipped uh, by many, although he seems to have tried. Uh, and that after he passed away, the very next uh, pharaoh moved sort of right back to uh, sort of the multiple uh, you know, uh, gods and polytheistic system that came before. Nonetheless, uh, it is interesting to speculate, uh, there may be some evidence, uh, that this might have been a precursor to and an influence on the first uh, you know, true and big monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, later on. Uh, uh, as Professor Perry says, Aminotep sought to replace traditional polytheism with the worship of uh, Aten, a single god of all people, a supreme force in nature represented as the sun disk, so yet another sun god. Uh, and uh, he took the name Akhenaten. Actually, he's more well known as uh, Akhenaten as, than as Aminotep. Uh, and uh, a, a servant, you know, means servant of Aten, servant of this god. And moved the capital from Thebes, uh, uh, you know, uh, to a newly uh, constructed holy city. Uh, so, uh, also, just uh, in passing, the pharaoh that followed him that moved right back to polytheism uh, was a kid, a child pharaoh uh, who died uh, actually young as well. So, it was only pharaoh. I can't say it for a short time. Uh, uh, but that's Tutankhamun. Uh, the only thing that makes Tutankhamun uh, a kind of a name uh, to be recognized today is uh, that his tomb uh, a few decades ago uh, was unearthed and all of the riches uh, and goodies within it uh, have been on display uh, uh, in museums ever since. It's gone on tour a number of times where they take uh, all or most of the exhibits, riches and statues and whatever else uh, and uh, uh, you know he uh, uh, he was mummified to Tutankhamun, which was something the Egyptians did uh, with uh, you know deceased rulers. Uh, but I was uh, fortunate when I was a kid to be able to see that when I was in the Bay Area uh, one time. Uh, it's quite uh, astonishing the amount of uh, uh, you know, riches and artifacts and things of gold and all kinds of valuable materials that were put in uh, the tombs of uh, rulers, pharaohs like. Tutankhamun. Ramses II in the 19th dynasty in the New Kingdom, uh, uh, as one source has said, led a life of unparalleled luxury. Uh, he's considered one of uh, Egypt's greatest pharaohs ever, uh, mainly because he led many, many successful military campaigns and pushed their uh, aggressive empire uh, out even further. He had huge temples, monuments, and statues, mostly of himself built, uh, uh, which says something, I think, about the ego there. Uh, and he was the first and only pharaoh to be made completely out of stone, as you see on the right. Joke. Uh, you guys need to loosen up a little bit. Get out a little bit more. I know it's hard with COVID, but come on. Loosen up. Egyptian hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphs. <laughs> uh, hieroglyphics, too. Uh, uh, pictorial, uh, but not syllabic, it means this uh, language uh, was written language was pictographic, uh, not syllabic. So uh, our alphabet, uh, right, is syllabic uh, in that there's syllables and the letters and words are put together based on sound, uh, not on the picture of what you're describing or talking about. Uh, and the pictorial written systems that came before the alphabet, like uh, cuneiform writing in Mesopotamia, hieroglyphs here, uh, were much harder to master because there are thousands of symbols required when you're not doing it uh, sort of uh, in a syllabic uh, way. Right? The alphabet ended up later being uh, an incredible uh, uh, improvement. Uh, there are other alphabets too that are improvements on this, but you know, in our part of the world, uh, the alphabet uh, right, allowed anyone to quickly master written language, reading and writing. Uh, remember that in Mesopotamia, and it's the same here, it took years and years of education uh, to uh, become just fluent uh, in written language. So you'd have to get the, the equivalent of like a PhD just to be able to read and write effectively. We learned that by the time we're like six uh, because of the alphabet, uh, which simplifies things greatly because there's 26 symbols and, you know, there's new numbers, of course, too, but uh, there's thousands of symbols. You can see some of that. Uh, in the uh, graphic on the right. 
The crowning achievement of Egyptian culture, I think undoubtedly, is the aforementioned pyramids, mainly uh, of the Old Kingdom. Uh, so this is the maybe the best expression of the power of the pharaohs, uh, overall Egyptian beliefs, uh, uh, and, and sort of the, uh, the wealth and power of their entire culture. These pyramids are so extraordinary that you know, it, it's, in a sense, the Egyptians flexing their muscles even today, saying, see how incredible uh, we were, uh, the amount of uh, power we must have had, the amount of money we must have had, the amount of labor we could command uh, through our awesome power, meaning the Pharaoh's power. Uh, so uh, and in a way, these are monuments to their own uh, uh, political, economic, social system uh, that was successful, at least from the perspective of wealth and power. Uh, Michael Mann says, from this period date the largest man-made uh, constructions the earth has yet seen, the pyramids. Their construction without wheels, there, were no, there was no wheel yet, so no carts or wagons, nothing, must have involved labor of a scale, intensity, and coordination hitherto unparalleled. So uh, labor crews uh, you know, must have been massive, and these things uh, took decades sometimes to build. Uh, it, the pictures still don't do it justice. You can see the size, again, in scale, on scale uh, in the one on the right. Uh, but keep in mind that sometimes th there are uh, a couple million stones uh, that are stacked on top of each other. Uh, and I think I read that uh, each stone on average, at least one of the pyramids, but it's probably similar everywhere, uh, averaged about two and a half tons per stone. Uh, uh, and you pile a couple million of those on top of each other till you get that high up in the air. How? Without modern cranes and trucks and uh, uh, think, well, it's not a mystery. You can find it on online probably in a couple of seconds, uh, but it certainly uh, uh, took a great deal of ingenuity, know-how, engineering, you know, uh, experience, uh, and uh, again, lots of harnessing of labor, organization, uh, etc. The uh, pyramids here are a great example of, uh, well, a great example of how in any ancient society uh, that when you see something, engineering projects, you know, they're impressive. This is maybe the most impressive in the ancient world, but there's other uh, uh, achievements like this. Now, when you see this kind of thing, uh, it already tells you that power was centralized, as we know it was in Egypt, at least most of the time, meaning that uh, the pharaohs and their, you know, their government controlled a large sort of geographical area with a large population density, uh, right? If they, did, if they weren't centralized, they probably couldn't have harnessed, forced enough laborers to go out to get these things done. Secondly, you can tell uh, just from the fact that the pyramids are here, uh, they exist or ever existed, that there was hierarchy, which we know uh, was true as well. So hierarchy and centralization don't always go together, but they often do. Uh, centralization, again, means power uh, in one government, or the king, uh, over a large area, uh, over a large population base. Uh, hierarchy means it's pretty much top-down that the king, handful of advisors, uh, make the decisions. Power isn't spread out you know, between like a, a king and a, you know elected legislature and a court system and a rule of law, a constitution, uh, like in our system. Uh, some of those things. Uh, so uh, this is hierarchical. Well, wh why does it have to be hierarchical? Uh, so why, when we see the pyramids, should we already know, oh, this was a hierarchy, even if we knew nothing else yet about Egypt? Uh, well, because the project doesn't get done any other way. In the modern world, it changes. With modern technology, we can now organize big projects, engineering and otherwise, uh, you know, without at least some hierarchical power. But in the ancient world, there's just no other way. Uh, a, a simple way to sort of make the point would be if I'm the pharaoh and I, uh, you know, say, okay, I need to have a, by the way, the most important sort of feature of all, these were tombs, uh, right, burial tombs for pharaohs. I said that about Tutankhamun's tomb, but these are sort of uh, different uh, pyramids for different pharaohs. So each one to kind of go out, uh, you know, with sort of a, a more impressive pyramid than their predecessors. So there's a bit of competition, uh, most likely, in this as well. Uh, so uh, the, the, the pyramids then had religious uh, purposes, and uh, not surprisingly, sort of signs of uh, religion uh, and religious belief uh, inside them. Belief in afterlife is evident, uh, just the fact that they're built, but even what uh, you see uh, in them uh, as well. Uh, but 
uh, if I'm the Pharaoh uh, and I say, okay, I need a, uh, I'm going to have a tomb built for myself uh, when I pass away someday uh, to be buried in, uh, and it's going to be big. So let's see uh, uh, my people here. Let's see a show of hands. Who wants to go out in the hot sun for the next 15 years uh, for low pay or no pay uh, under, you know, in the hot, you know, sun, uh, very little water, uh, terrible food. You'll probably die in like a year. Who wants to? N nobody. No hands go. Okay, never. Never mind. I won't. I won't have a, a pyramid. I won't have a tomb. Of course, uh, that's not going to be happening. There's, there's not. A, you don't ask. You tell them. You're going out. Uh, you're going to work, and you're going to work as long as I say, uh, or else. Uh, so th these kind of projects don't get done unless there's top-down hierarchical power. Period. Uh, uh, just not in the ancient world. No way. Lastly, Egyptian culture, science, technology, literature. Uh, I'll move to this fairly swiftly. Uh, they fashioned a system of uh, geometry, so made some inroads in math. We know they did advanced engineering. We just covered it. In medicine, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, doctors, uh, uh, clinicians identified illness. Uh, uh, theoreticians uh, realized that uncleanliness led to contagion. They had some understanding of anatomy, even did some operations. Uh, by the way, some of those operations must have been successful, uh, otherwise we wouldn't even, you know, that wouldn't even be here. Uh, so, uh, although I wouldn't have wanted to be operated on uh, in ancient Egypt. I mean, if I lived then, that was my only option. Uh, but if I could take the choice of being operated on now or then, uh, duh. Uh, so it sounds frightening to think, well, in ancient Egypt, they did operations? Uh, but some of them were successful, not all of them. Uh, we think, okay, identifying illnesses, understanding that cleanliness, cleanliness uh, or uncleanliness leads to contagion, big deal, duh. But remember, we're talking about thousands of years ago and the process of learning, uh, right, uh, comes with a learning curve. So uh, these were uh, you know, pretty big uh, strides forward, actually, in knowledge at the time. So it's more impressive than it actually sounds. Perry says Egyptian doctors examined the body in a scientific way. So they were at least thinking in terms of science, even if they didn't have the same uh, you know, advantages, uh, knowledge base, uh, the technologies that we have now uh, to sort of do it uh, even uh, further. In terms of literature, creative work, the Book of the Dead, one of the most famous uh, series of hymns, litanies, religious writings uh, to guide, at least that was the uh, intent, to guide the deceased between life and afterlife. There was kind of a, 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 an in-between period uh, that was believed to be there, and this was a, a, a sort of a guide uh, to that. Uh, but uh, there's some beautiful hymns and uh, writings uh, in it. Uh, the Egyptians are all kinds of different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, literature, poetry, fantasy, uh, adventure stories, etc., uh, so a great deal of creativity, uh, actually, in the arts. And the prevailing theme of much of this uh, was that the divine order is eternal and uh, one must achieve harmony with it, which is something we really already said. So one of the values, this one at the bottom, that uh, was on our slide on values, uh, is exhibited in, in much uh, of the artistic and literary work uh, of ancient Egypt. Thank you.